Um, so welcome. I'm a professor at the business school. I study the history of leadership. Um, I was actually thinking about Dan's work. We have this, this huge privilege and pleasure to have Dan Arelli here. Um, I'll let him talk to you about his journey, a fascinating journey that's be that begins for the purposes of our discussion and his work actually with a long stay in the hospital. Right? So we'll st and that became a platform and an impetus and an extraordinary greenhouse for both uh, path-breaking scholarship. He studies Iraq, he, well, his, one of his many best-selling books is called Predictably Irrational. He studies right, the aspects of behavior that are so important and so defining for us and yet don't fit neatly into pristine economic models. Um, and he has a lot, I think, to say to us here at the center of the storm in a very turbulent, exciting, and also perilous time in the most important sector in our country's economy and in our country's lives. So I, I don't want to say any more about myself, but uh, I want to just, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions and so we can get a sense of some of the fascinating nuggets and, and terra firma that he has unearthed um, as a scholar and speaker and just deep thinker and human being. And then we'll open it up for questions. How does that sound as a, as a little appetizer to our strategic client forum? Sound good? Okay. All right, so let me just start, Dan, with, um, with where you start, at least in your, many of your books and in some of your talks. Uh, your, the, the great <coughs> amount of time and energy you, not by choice, but by necessity invested, spent in the healthcare system and how that's affected your journey and your findings and... Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when I, I grew up in Israel and when I was uh, 18, I was uh, next to a magnesium flare, one of those bombs that the military sends up to the sky to light up a battlefield. And one of those got exploded next to me. And I uh, was wounded with about 70% of my body was burned. And I spent about three years in hospitals. And I don't need to tell you, but hospitals are a, an amazing place to observe irrational behavior. <laughs> uh, and I, I learned a lot of lessons, but uh, may, maybe the, the first one was the question of bandage removal. So, so imagine that most of your body was covered with burns and somebody had to take the bandages off and there were two strategies. They could either de rip the bandages off quickly, trying to minimize the duration of the treatment, but every second was going to be very painful. Or you could rip the bandages off slowly, take a long time, but each second is not that painful. And just think to yourself, what would you prefer? So let's get a vote. Uh, how many people would prefer the quick ripping approach? OK, how many prefer the slow approach? OK, uh, this is also a test of how many you've read any of my books. Um, it's also interesting to look at the gender difference, right? Because women who wax their legs uh, think they have some intuitions about that. Uh, topic. <laughs> but hair actually behaves differently. And the nurses in my, <coughs> in my department thought that the ripping approach was the right one. And that's what they did. And as a patient, I didn't like that. And I, I asked them to try things slower, take more time, give me some breaks. And they said two things. The first thing they said was that they knew what was the right thing to do, right? They were professionals. And the second thing, they reminded me that the word patient doesn't mean to buddy in or intervene or make suggestions. <laughs> uh, this was in Israel, in Hebrew, but, but the word patient actually is surprising. It has this passive element in every uh, language I've encountered. Anyway, I, I kept on complaining and they kept on doing what they thought was right. And we passed a few more years like this. And when I left the hospital, I started studying at the university. And I learned about the experimental method. And what's so nice about the experimental method is that if you have something you're not sure about, you can bring it to an experiment. You can have multiple conditions, and to the extent you replicate in your experiment the life that you're trying to represent, you might get a, an answer to your riddle. So I had this question. You have duration, and you have intensity. And you have an experience that lasts over time. And the question is, what would maximize a good experience or minimize the badness of a bad experience? Right? And how does, it, how does it work out? So originally I didn't have money, much money for research, so I, bought, I went to a hardware store and I bought a carpenter's vise. You know, one of those things that they use to put pieces of wood together. 
And I set it up in the lab and I invited people to come and put two fingers in this vice. <laughs> and I would crunch people's fingers just a little bit. Uh, different duration, intensities, pattern of pain over time. Uh, I published my first paper on this and then I got more research funding, so I moved to better equipment. <laughs> Electrical shocks, annoying sounds. <laughs> <coughs> I even created a pain suit. This was a suit that had 300 feet of hoses stitched through it, and I could get people to be very cold and very hot. Um, I also did experiments on winning and losing money, which ends up being not too different from physical pain. <laughs> and, and across all of those, I learned that the nurses were wrong in some very, very systematic ways. Right? So first of all, if you take duration, and you take a bad experience and you make it twice as long, you don't make it twice as bad. You make it slightly worse, but not by much. You change the amplitude of the experience, now you make things really bad. Now the nurses got it wrong. They were trying to shrink the duration, which people are not too sensitive to, at the expense of the amplitude, which people really care about. The second thing is, it turns out that the progression of pain over time matters a great deal. You start with low pain that ends high, it's much worse than pain that starts high and go yeah. down over time. And again, the nurses were doing it wrong. They were starting at my feet and ending up at my head for convenience. But that gave me the wrong progression of pain over time. And finally, for really long periods of pain, it's really good to give people, uh, patients, a, a kind of a break, a chance to kind of stop, brace themselves, and prepare for the next period of pain. And they got it all wrong. And the question is, how come? And, and I went back to the burn department, I, I gave a talk, I've, I've been giving lots of lectures in, in uh, hospitals and nursing schools since. Um, but when I finished my, my first talk with them, my, my favorite nurse, Etty, came to me after the talk and she said, um, you know, you forgot one thing, that I forgot her pain. She said she was in the room too, this was no picnic for her either, uh, but she was feeling the pain only through me and maybe time was more important for her. <laughs> Right, but we agree that the goal of medical treatment is not to minimize the nurse's pain. Um, and then I said, look, why didn't you just try it a couple of times my way? You didn't have to switch completely. You could have just try it a few times. Why, why not even a few times? And the way she explains it, was, explained it was, was very actually instructive to me because she said that every day she could do what everybody else was doing, what she was told to do, what was the regular approach of doing things. Or she could do something different, what I asked her to do. But her gut intuition <coughs> did not tell her that this was a good idea. Her gut intuition told her that what she's been doing all the time, which is the quick gripping approach, is the right approach. So out of goodness, she was really not trying something else. And for me, this is such an important lesson. You know, we go around life, and there are so many times in which we act just based on gut intuition. The data is actually not that good. We've never actually tested this other path. We've, everybody's doing this path, everybody's behaving like this, everybody tells us that this is the right approach, but we don't have actually have data to tell us this is the right approach. So there are these other approaches that we haven't tested. And we feel they're not right. But what if we tested them? What if we started thinking that our intuitions might be off? Give us an example. So give us an example, please. So um, let me, let me can I, I switch to a very different domain. So let me, let me talk to you about a domain for a few minutes of something that has nothing to do with medicine, okay? And this is dishonesty. So really like nothing, nothing connected. Um, <laughs> so uh, imagine I gave you the following game. Uh, I gave you a die, a six-sided die, and I told it I'll pay you based on whatever the die comes up on. Cups up on six, I'll give you six dollars, five, five dollars, and so on. And I ask you to roll it, and then we'll see what happens. But you can get paid based on the top side or the bottom side. It's up to you. You decide, but don't tell me. So imagine all of you are in the experiment, and I ask you to pick top or bottom, top or bottom. So please pick. Have you picked? In your mind? Great. Now you roll the die. And it came with five on the bottom and two on the top. And now I say, what did you pick? Now if you picked bottom, you say bottom, no problem, and you get $5. If you've picked top, <coughs> there's a dilemma, <laughs> right? <coughs> do you say top and get $2, or do you change your decision after the fact and say bottom? 
And we get people to do this 20 times. And every time they say top or bottom, top or bottom, and they roll the coin. And what we find is that people are unbelievably lucky. It's just amazing. <laughs> Now, people are not perfectly lucky, but they kind of get 13 or 14 times correct, which is, which is amazing. Um, <coughs> now the question of intuition. <coughs> Imagine you're doing the same exact experiment, and every time you write, the die came with five on the bottom, two on the top, I chose this, and you keep on. But your significant other is sitting next to you. Do you cheat more or less or the same? Who thinks the same? Who thinks less? Who thinks more? OK, so people cheat more. People cheat more. Now, why would they cheat more? Why would they cheat more? Let me tell you about another experiment. We do another experiment with the same thing, but we connect people to a lie detector. And we ask whether the lie detector can detect when people lie. And the answer is yes. Basically, not all the time, but quite, it's, a good, it's a good signal. In another version of the experiment, people pick a charity that they love. And all the money they make in the experiment goes directly to the charity. They make nothing. What happens when people can lie for a charity? They lie more, and the lie detector doesn't detect anything anymore. Oh. Why? Because dishonesty, the feeling of uncomfortable that the lie detector detects, is the tension between it feels wrong, I want more money. It feels wrong, I want more money. But if it feels right, there's no problem, right? You think Robin Hood felt bad, right? <laughs> Imagine you connected him to. Now, let's go back to what happened when you sit next to your significant other. What happened when you sit next to your significant other? All of a sudden, you think like you're cheating for all of you, right? It's not just for you, it's not as selfish, it's for the good of the family. By the way, Lots of things like this happen when people think they are cheating, for example, in the No Child Left Behind, uh, after the, uh, uh, you've, you've seen some of the scandal that have come after the No Child Left Behind policy, when you put teachers in unattainable situations where they can't possibly get the kids to perform at the level that they need to do to maintain the budget for the schools. And they find lots of ways to cheat. And I suspect that there's lots of applications for this in healthcare where it's not that people are going to cheat for themselves, but they're going to cheat for the group because all kinds of uh, other things are going to be at risk if they don't behave like this. So it's, now if you think about this, and I'll just make this last point, our model of dishonesty is a cost-benefit model. It's a model that people think about punishment and they're afraid of the punishment, and they curb their behavior because of the punishment. Turns out we have no evidence for that, including the worst punishment of them all, the death penalty. Right? What do you think happens? We have some states that have the death penalty, some states that don't. You think we have lower crime rate in states that have the death penalty? No. I mean, how, how, how is it supposed to work? You come home at the end of the day, pissed off with your significant other, you take a knife from the kitchen, you want to kill them, and then you say, oh, we have the death penalty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, me, let me do something else. Um, but, but think about this. Our theory, our prediction, is that people are afraid of the punishment, and because of that, they misbehave. It turns out that's a wrong theory. I mean, it would have been nice if it worked. It just doesn't work. Instead, a theory of dishonesty is very, very different, it, which means that if we want to change dishonesty, we have to actually understand what brings it about, right? rather than assume a wrong theory. You want some more examples? Yeah, a couple more examples, and I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to drill down, double-click, okay. and ask you to like, tell us some more about healthcare in this, in this brain. OK, so I'll tell you about one, one more experiment we've done recently. Um, so we try to get very poor people to save some money. And it's not as if we hope that they'll ever have money for retirement. Uh, but what we hope to get is to give them a rainy day fund. Like what happens is if you're very poor, uh, this we did at Kibera, it's a slum in Kenya. And let's say you're in Kibera and you have a goat and your goat gives you 20% of your income. And one day your goat is sick, you live from hand to mouth, there's no, you don't have any extra. So what do you do? You have to borrow. If you live at Kibera, you borrow it about 10% a week. Let's say that four weeks later, your goat is healthy. 
Still, you're four weeks behind plus interest rate, really hard to get out of this. So we're trying to get people to, to save a little bit of money in a rainy day fund. Now, what would happen if we give, gave money, this money to these people in their pocket? What would happen? They would find ways to use it. They would find good ways to use it. They will buy better food. They will buy more water, more kerosene. I mean, they'll buy good things. So we want to put the money a little bit further away from them, right? So they can't reach it. So we teamed up with the, the, the cell phone, Safaricom, an investment bank, and people could text in their money into their account, but every night the investment bank took the money and put it into the investment bank. So you could easily put money in by texting, but if you wanted to get the money out, you'll have to take a bus, go to the city, mm -hmm. fill a form, wait about an hour, take a bus back. The whole thing would take five hours. So you could do it if there was an emergency, but it wouldn't burn a hole in your pocket. It wasn't easy to do. So that's what we, we started. Easy in, hard out. And then we took the people and we divided them into groups. And different groups gave different incentives to save in this retirement fund. So some people we gave nothing, just this plan. And they saved a tiny bit. Some people we gave a text message once a week, every Thursday. We send them a text message and say, hey, it would be a good idea to try and save about 100 shillings this week. 100 shillings is a little less than a dollar, and these people live on about $10 a week. <coughs> um, other people, we send them a text message with, uh, with the same message, but as if it came from their kids. We knew the name of their kids, and we said, hi mom, hi dad, this is little Joey, it will be a good idea to save 100 shillings this week. Other people, we gave them a 10% match. Up to 100 shillings, at the end of the week, you'll get a 10% match. Other people, we gave 20% match. Other people, we gave pre-match. What is pre-match? One of the most basic principles in behavioral economics is loss aversion. Loss aversion is the idea that people hate losing more than you enjoy gaining. Think about how your life would look like if you lost 10% in the stock market versus gained. Or if you flipped a coin and you lost $100, how would you feel if you won $100? There's asymmetry there. So what we did was we put the money in their account in the beginning of the week, either 10%, 10 shilling, or 20%, 20 shillings. And we said, if you save, you get to keep it. If not, we'll take it oh, back. Wow. Okay. Right? And the idea was that the experience of having it removed will be so unpleasant it'll start saving. And the last group, we made a coin, um, and we carved 24 numbers on the edge of the coin. And the program lasted 24 weeks, so we had the number for each week. And every week we asked them to take the coin out, we asked them to put someone in their hat, take a knife, and scratch that number for the week, horizontally if they didn't save, and vertically if they saved. We had some other method, but let's just stick with those. So we have, just to remind you, nothing, text, text from kids, 10% post-match, 20% post-match, 10% pre-match, 20% pre-match, and the coin. Now let me ask you, which one do you think worked the best? So how many people, and by the way, you can't not vote here. You have to have an opinion, okay? <laughs> uh, how many of you think that uh, just text worked the best? Nobody? Good. It actually wasn't the best. How many of you think that it worked, that it actually increased saving to some degree? Yeah, that's right. It, it, it did help, but it was far from the best. How many of you think that text message from the kids was the best? Usually it's young people without kids that think this way. <laughs> um, how many of you think that 10% post-match worked the best? 20% post-match? 10% pre-match? 20% pre-match? I'm voting twice. <laughs> how many of you think the coin... Okay, how many of you haven't vote? Did, didn't vote? <laughs> Anybody? Okay. So here is what happened. Just giving people this plan was better than nothing. Good news. Reminding them once a week helped, quite substantially, but helped. 10% post-match helped a bit more. 20% post-match was just like the 10%, no difference. 10% pre-match helped a bit more. 20% pre-match, just like 10%. Kids, by the way, are just like 10% pre-match, <laughs> if, you're, if you're thinking about it. <laughs> and the big surprise was the, the coin. coin. Jesus. The coin basically doubled savings compared to everything else. 
And, and now the question is why? Now, uh, my research center is called the Center for Advanced Hindsight. Just <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, it's a little hard to get government funding with this name, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but the reason we call it this is because we want to remind ourselves and other people how easy it is to predict results in hindsight and say, yes, I knew that all along. But now that we know the coin worked the best, why do you think it worked the best? Give me some suggestions. Why, why was it so successful? Recognition? Recognition, so it's interesting because nobody, people don't visit each other's huts, but it was somewhere in the, in the hut, right? So there was something about the family. What else? Minimal effort. Minimal effort? Compared to what, everything else? It was actually a bit more effort than everything else, but it was some effort. There was a scoreboard, there was a, there was a tracking. Actually, yeah. we wanted to get the coins back and see what they actually tracked. We just couldn't get them back. People they give them back to you? They liked them so much, <laughs> yes. Some excitement, something interesting. People would see what they did. People would see what they did, yeah. So there's lots of possibilities, of course. Um, so let me tell you about another study, very different study. This was a study in which they took kids in Oklahoma. Wait a minute, do you have an answer there? I'll, I'll come okay, back, we'll okay, come okay. back. Just <coughs> facilitator's I'm, job and I'm telling a story, I'm telling a story. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so this was a, a study in which they opened, they took kids in Oklahoma and randomly opened to half of them college savings accounts. Randomly, not their parents, randomly, on the day where they were born. Two years ago, those kids, uh, turned out to be four, turned four, and they measured their cognitive and social skills. Guess what? The kids with, so, with, with college savings accounts performed better. How can that be? Do you think that the kids know that they're headed to college? Uh, by, by the way, the account had less than $1,000, so it's not enough for college. The kids had no idea that they're headed to college, of course, but their parents knew, and they were oh. reminded once a month. Now imagine what happens if yeah. once a month you're reminded yeah. that this little kid is college yeah. bound. Yeah. Do you read to them for a few more yeah. minutes? Do you buy them another Huge. book? You know, if you think about something over four, four years, you don't need big interventions. Now let's go back to our coin. When we look at the days of the week, people saved mostly on Thursday, which was the day we texted them. Some people saved on Friday. Because some people don't have their own phone, they just have a SIM card and they just put it in somebody else's phone so they get the text message actually the next day. In the coin condition, people saved also in the other days of the week. What happened was the coin was actually around to remind them about something. That's right? Now think about it, actually the, the digital world is kind of interesting because in the digital world, when everything is apps, when do we think about apps? Only when we think about them unless there's notifications. But actually the physical world creates tremendous possibility of getting people to think about something that might have not thought in a different way. I mean, imagine that there's this huge universe of things that could occupy your mind. What is actually occupying your mind at each point? Is it the relevant things? Not necessarily. It's a subset, but not necessarily the relevant subset. So now the question is when you do any kind of information display, how do you actually ensure that people think about the right stuff? By the way, in medicine, I think that the white coat, the stethoscope, all of those things are reminders. They're, of course, reminders to the patients about who they are and who the doctor is, but there are actually lots of reminders in that, in that environment. So anyway, these are some, some examples, and you, know, you can think about the specific examples, but you can also think about <coughs> two things. One is the potential for interventions that are outside of the things we're currently considering, right? When you uh, would approach the question of savings, you wouldn't say, let's just open randomly to kids' sa college savings account, or let's give people reminders, right? It wouldn't be something that is the standard. Um, and it also means about kind of questioning our intuitions. I think that uh, for me, the biggest lessons from, from behavioral economics is, is some kind of modesty about the quality of our, our intuition. So first of all, we haven't tested a lot of things. Uh, we have some biased opinions, uh, but also we have some really bad procedures. We just need to kind of figure out what doesn't work well and to try to fix it. Okay. It's very interesting. I mean, I'm, as, as I read, I read uh, Dan's book, uh, 
last week in preparation for this, and I, and it, the book, the predictably irrational, and the book, which is pitched at a little bit different level than he's speaking tonight, and without so much sparkling wit and uh, hey hey sparkling sparkling <laughs> wit but sparkling and understated it. wit uh, the book the book makes uh, quite a convincing case in, in in different slices chapter by chapter for considering things outside what we would call the reasonable and the rational and part of what he's saying here is about it seems to me is about how just the rational box of, mm -hmm. of, of the universe of what we might think about and the way we might behave is, is not necessarily complete or even necessarily the best way. And I'm reminded of Lincoln, who I'm writing about in this book, I'm writing, uh, writing on the making of leaders. I have five of them. And he, go, he goes into the White House convinced that it's all about reason. He'd been a lawyer. Mm -hmm. he, wrote a he wrote a paper about the absolute compelling divine power of reason. And he, gets to, he gets it, finds himself at the middle of the Civil War and all bets are off. And reason isn't gonna take him anywhere. Not, not, a, not in terms of bloodshed, not in terms of the next move, not in terms of pushing his reluctant generals to fight. And he's got to find something else. And actually, he finds a, a road in because he's with the Emancipation Proclamation, a road forward because he's backed into absolute desperation. None of the calculated, reasonable approaches work. So, so here's, here's, my, here's my question for you, and then we'll, we'll see where it takes us, because I can tell already it's an adventure every time Dan speaks. Um, uh, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, so, what, 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 what? Can you drop a couple of pearls? Partly an appetizer for your main course tomorrow before the group, but also for us tonight to get conversation and thought juices flowing um, about how some of this might apply very directly <clears throat> to both healthcare provision, the provision of care. You talked about the nurses, but also remember, and I know you thought about this to employees and providers and MAs and PAs and receptionists and docs and, and nurse practitioners and nurses and, and all the folks that go to work each day to try and make people better, right? So, because if we're gonna transform ourselves and, and learn to thrive in all this turbulence, a lot of our work will actually be inside with our own people. So, take it away. Okay, so, a couple of things, I think that, uh, I don't think anybody would disagree that the majority of healthcare spending comes from bad decisions. And I don't mean physicians. I think that we are, we're killing ourselves with bad decisions. Smoking, diabetes, obesity, heart, heart conditions. I mean, there's no question that if you say um, what, what's costing us so much, um, it's bad decisions, right? And, and if you, if you want to fix it. Oh, and, and the other thing that is quite clear is that people know that these are bad decisions, right? It's not as if you need to tell people. Um, I'll tell you a little story on this. Um, one day I, 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 in my class, uh, there was a guy who was on the board of trustees of our uh, medical school, and he came to my class to sit. I didn't know him at the time. He came to introduce himself after the class. His name was Tom, and he was the CEO at the time of a company called Panda Express. Do you know Panda Express? Great. What do they sell? Almost. They sell orange chicken, <laughs> right? <laughs> they, have, they have lots of things on the menu. They have lots of things on the menu. What they really sell is orange chicken. I can't tell you the percentage. is frightening. And orange chicken, <coughs> orange chicken is a terrible thing. It is unbelievably unhealthy. It's a death food? It, it's fried, fried twice, has a lot of salt and sugar. They are by no far, by stretch of the imagination, they're not a health food place, but orange chicken is the worst thing they have. But how many of us have had orange chicken? It's really good, right, for the same, <laughs> for the same things. Anyway, Tom asked me, what do I do with orange chicken? So we convince him to give us a store and for us to play with because we know we're experimentalists. <laughs> so he gives us a store and we post calorie information on every item. And what do you think happened? Absolutely nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> New York City then decides to post <laughs> calorie information. What happened in New York City? Almost nothing. Actually, there was some, oh, there were some terrible cases in which they put like price and calories and poor people got worse food. 
because they were like getting more calories per the, per the buck was like, you know, they felt like it, like it felt like good value because you're getting more calories per dollar. Um, now, by the way, the US government has regulated that every fast food, every restaurant that has more than 20 branches has to put calorie labeling on. Now, look, there's no evidence that this is working and it's costly and it uh, makes it difficult to change items on the menu. It does all kinds of terrible things. Why are we doing this? It's because we believe in information. Right? We believe that in many cases, all we need to do is give people the right information and they will go ahead and do the right thing. It's as if the morning after the calorie labeling in New York worked out, somebody walked into McDonald's and said, wow, I had no idea. Right? <laughs> Up to now, I was sure this was health food. <laughs> how, come, how come nobody told me? Uh, by the way, with, uh, with, with lots of bad decisions of this type, of course, it's not that every bad decision kills us, like texting and driving, but it's that the accumulation of them is incredibly devastating. Um, so, so we have this idea that just giving people information is going to help. But frankly, I can't think about a case in history in which giving people information helped in, in a big scale. I'm not talking about one person. Right? Uh, so, so we have this problem that we have, people are killing, we're killing ourselves, um, and we're trying to push information down, and it's just not, not going to work out. So that's one thing to think about. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. Um, another thing I want to tell you about, this is something we're not going to talk about tomorrow, is kind of connected to incentives. <coughs> so let me tell you about the study we've done at uh, Intel. So uh, these are people who make chips. They come to the factory and they make computer chips. And what's nice about people who make computer chips is you can measure how many chips they make. And you know, if I had to measure your own, your productivity here, it will be very hard, right? When, when are you producing more or less? People who make chips, easy to measure. Now, these people come for four days, 12-hour shifts, and then they have four days off. Four days on, four days off. And Intel, for a long time, had this procedure that for the first day of the work cycle, the first day of the eight, they give them a thought, and they say, if you produce 1,300 chips, we'll give you $25. So they have a threshold bonus. If you reach it, you get it. If you're below, you get nothing. And then the second day, there's no bonus. The third day, there's no bonus. The fourth day, there's no bonus. And then four days off. Okay? So think about this, this system. So when we heard this, we tried to get them to do some experiments with us. So the first thing we asked to do was to have a control condition. What's a control condition? A condition which we don't have anything. Let's just compare these $25 to nothing. And they agreed. So then we pushed our luck a little further and we said, what if we have a third condition in which we send people pizza at home? We said, if you perform at this level, we'll send people pizza at home. We'll make them heroes in the eyes of their families. It turns out that for the HR department of Intel, uh, sending people pizza at home is too complex. <laughs> Um, but they agreed, so they agreed to send people a voucher for pizza. It's not the same, it's not the same, no. but, but still. Okay, and then we tried a fourth condition in which we send people a message from the boss saying, nice job. So imagine that's what happened. People come on that first day, quarter of the people are told nothing, quarter of the people are told if you get to this level, you get $25, you get to this level, a voucher for pizza, you get to this level, a nice text message from the boss. And now the question to you is, which group performed the best? How many people think that the money people did the best? The pizza? The text? Very good, very interesting. By the way, how many of you give rewards kind of like texts? How many of you give most of your reward more like money? Okay. Um, so, first of all, all three of these methods, money, pizza, and text, did better than a control condition, but they all did exactly the same. Oh, interesting. However, we had the next day. Remember, in the next day, there was no bonus, but the question was, was there any residual effect? 
What happened now? Performance on the first day went up by 5%. On the second day, performance in the money condition went down below the control condition. It's as if those people said, yesterday you gave me some money, I worked extra hard, today there's no money, I'm not interested. <laughs> and really their motivation dipped and then it went a little bit up and back to the control condition. In total, by the way, Intel, by spending these $25, lost 5% of productivity. Compared, to, the doing, dip, compared the to doing nothing, compared to doing nothing, wow. right? Wow. So with this, with this result, we went to the management of Intel and we said, look, your intuition was that this would work. You've been doing this for years. We actually showed you it backfires. It's not that you don't make any money. You lose money and productivity. We said, maybe your intuitions about reward is wrong more generally. Maybe also when you come to executive compensation, uh, your, your theory of compensation motivation is not right. Let us, let us play with those incentives <laughs> as well. Um, but of course, there was no interest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, what happened to the, to the text message? I told you it went up the same as mm -hmm. the money. It went down slowly throughout the week. And the pizza was between. It went up the same, went down slightly below the control condition. And I'm willing to bet that if the pizza was more like real pizza, it would have been more like the compliment. If it was more voucher-like, it would have looked more like the money. Now, here's the big thing. The big thing is that in the modern workplace, and this includes people who make chips, we depend a lot on people's goodwill. Sure you know, people have a tremendous amount of latitude to decide how much to work and how much to shirk. And the question is, what creates goodwill? And the answer is that sometimes the particular way we pay people can actually decrease yeah. goodwill rather than increase it. So think about all the ways in which, and I'm particularly worried about physicians, but I think it applies more generally. Think about all the ways in which your compensation and your goodwill toward your employer are dependent. Right. What are the things that truly create goodwill? Yeah. It's things like being appreciated. Right? It's uh, things like feeling that you have autonomy, that you have control, uh, that there is a sense of progression. What will happen in your jobs if I basically broke your year into hours and pay you an hourly rate by how many, I don't know, PowerPoint presentations you create or you know, something, <laughs> uh, something like that. Words you, you type on email. You know, it will be an incredibly demoralizing world. Yeah. But, but somehow, you know, it's kind of one of those lessons that are so obvious once you say it. But, but so when you look yeah. at the yeah. systems we design, we rarely design those systems. Anyway. Okay, I have to make one flash, and then I'm going to ask my, my esteemed colleague, John Fox, about time. But I, I, I do a lot of work. I write about leaders in turbulence. What's effective leadership in intensifying turbulence? So, I was just thinking that in, in a, in, when you're trying to transform an organization, a set of attitudes, uh, a mission, in, a, in all that turbulence, it's all about goodwill. It's all about goodwill from your soldiers, metaphorically, and in Lincoln's case, you know, <coughs> literally, it's, it's about the goodwill of all these people that are both putting out fires and trying to fix the plane and re-engineer it in the turbulence. So this is really, really important. It's mm -hmm. all about goodwill. And yet, we think of goodwill, we don't, we don't talk about goodwill in economic models, right? Yeah. And, we, and everything we think about with motivation is about money. Paper for performance, right? Yeah. Uh, Frederick Taylor and the bonus, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, that's fascinating. Now, do we have time yeah. for a question or two? We've got about eight or nine minutes. Okay, so, uh, Eight or folks. nine, well, you're precise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, questions, observations, comments. We're gonna have lots of time over the next couple of days, but this is a great time to start flexing our, 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 our muscles. And we've got, there's, there's one over here, and we've got Mike, so just one sec, we'll bring a mic to you, okay? Can you just also say your name when you stand up, just so we know, we can kind of get to know people? Hi, my name is Teresa. Super. One of the things that you were talking about when you were doing the savings accounts was that the reason that the coin was successful was the reminder. But you had four other reminders. Why was that reminder more successful than the other reminders? Yeah. So, so remember, everything else was a reminder when the text happened. The coin was also in people's huts, All the time. so they saw it on the other days as well, right? So, so actually, we are now thinking about 
how do we design bank statements? You know, your bank statement tells you about stuff that has gone. Yeah. It's like historical record. It doesn't tell you anything about what to do next. But it's the time where your bank actually talks to you. It's <laughs> the only time that, that they really talk to you in a pleasant way. The rest of it is usually unpleasant. Or, uh, avo or avoidant. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Um, what, what would it look like? What, what should the front page of your bank statement look like, whether it's online or not, if it was about reminding you about which steps you should be taking and which steps you haven't taken yet, right? Have you opened a rainy day savings account? Have you maximized your 401k, right? How would it be if that was about the steps you should be taking and not about historical things? Because the fact is, you don't really think about all that stuff all along. But all of those informations are about getting you to think about stuff you wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Okay? Other questions? Steve, or? Yeah. I have uh, two, and one of them relates, we can probably turn it to tomorrow. Um, but as you know, there's been a lot of change in healthcare. Physicians uh, are now part of much bigger organizations, and over 50% of physicians are now employed by hospitals. And I think Hospitals are wrestling with this thing called physician alignment. And I think your talks, the, your writings about motivation are extremely important. I hope you can stay tomorrow. We have a spe special session on that. Uh, but I worry that you know we don't have the latest and greatest thinking being put to work in that area. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah. So, so look, I, I, I think physicians are a very special breed of people. And I think we do need to understand their motivation in a, in a really an amazing way. So, you know, how yeah, many... Sign up for that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, how, how, how many people can, can come home and, and feel that they have saved people? How many people can uh, get, get the same gratitude and, and respect in, in society? I mean, there's, it's, it's a tremendous role, it's a tremendous role in society. And I have a sense that we're really not letting physicians think about themselves as, as the heroes of society. And, and with that comes lots of uh, bad, uh, bad consequences. Um, physicians are stressed, uh, they, they feel overburdened, uh, they feel that they are uh, paper pushers. I mean, there's all kinds of things that basically, is, it's not what they've signed up for, it's not what they get recognized for, um, and I think there's lots of problems with that. And, and look, another thing to do is to figure out, I'm going to say one more thing about goodwill. You just fix all that. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. good. So I'll tell you a personal story. So, so I used to teach at MIT. And as you can imagine, at MIT, uh, we had an equation for how much we were supposed to teach. And we were supposed to teach 100 and, we were supposed to teach 112 points. And points had a way to create points. Uh, and basically, we had this equation. And I was really good at optimizing this equation. <laughs> so I was at the MIT for 10 years. I taught seven classes during those 10 years. Uh, so I mean not Seven different classes? No. I mean that for seven of the years, I taught one class. Wow. That's right? good. That's optimization. And, yes, right. and the class meets 12 times for three hours a week. So I, I was Jesus. hardly in the classroom. Now, I actually like teaching, uh, and I'm a good teacher. The, I mean, the students like me at least. I'm not sure about good teacher, but you know, they, they um, but, but they gave me this equation, and I optimized it. And it was not good for anybody. Now, when I moved to Duke, uh, they said, look, we don't have this point system. Instead, what you do is you meet with the dean, and you figure out what makes sense for this year. And you know what? It's a much better system. And actually, a couple of years ago, they gave me a different job at the university. Um, and now I don't have a dean anymore. So I officially, I have no responsibilities. <laughs> like, <coughs> my, my job title basically said, what's my title? And what's my salary? And that's it. And I don't have to teach. I don't have to do administration. Officially, I don't have to do anything. But that's How's that working? <laughs> it's actually more hard work because, because of reciprocity. So I'm actually running around the university teaching in all kinds of departments. <laughs> I'm inventing new courses that I couldn't do 
in my previous job, but it really is about goodwill, right? So the university basically gave me a card blank and said, you have a job for life and you don't have to officially do anything. Um, and I took it as, a, as an opportunity to try and do all kinds of interesting things that I couldn't do uh, before. Now, I'm not saying nobody ever takes advantage of, of opportunities, but, but I think that goodwill Absolutely. is incredibly important. Um, I'll, I'll give you one last example. Imagine that you were married, uh, those who are married, um, and your contract was weekly. And every Friday you would wake up and you would look at your significant other and you would say, honey, do you want to do it for another week or should we uh, <laughs> stop it quits. now? And <clears throat> week by week, how much would you invest in this relationship? Not that much. Yeah. Right? The fact is that across everything we do, uh, investment and goodwill comes from long-term commitment. But, but we're decreasing all of that. So, and I think, I think we're losing a lot of the goodwill and the long-term alignment by just giving people the sense that they are uh, replaceable and they could move at any point. That's depressing. Do you have like a happy question? Uh, I do. No. This one, this one I think actually is equally depressing. Okay. Um, and it, it has to do, you, you had an example in one of the things you wrote about or one of your TED Talks of The Economist, I think it was, had the three different offers that it gave consumers about, do you want this package, this package? And the, the power of how that, construct, how, how that was constructed, yep. I think, is a big deal in healthcare. As we move to more and more, quote, <coughs> shopping, end quote, whether it's consumers shopping for plans or consumers shopping for their care, or it's even providers shopping for who they want to partner with, that kind of game, I don't want to call it game playing, that kind of packaging, positioning, whatever, how are we going to, how are we going to make sure that gets done properly? Yeah, so, so this is, I, I'll, I'll show you some examples tomorrow, but this is about the fact that we make decisions as a function of the environment that we're in. Yeah. Think Good about question. the line in the buffet. I could design a buffet line that you will eat healthy, and I could design a buffet which we will, you will not eat uh, healthy. We could put the fries first. We could put them in a corner that says only for people who don't care about their health. I mean, there's lots of ways to, <coughs> to get the same food and get people to make very different choices. Um, the good news, I think, is that digital technology uh, is giving us tremendous possibilities to design the environment in the right way. It also gives us tremendous possibility to design the environment in the wrong way. Uh, right? So, but, but if we think about it correctly, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, much more than we had before, in terms of presenting information both to physicians and to patients. So I'm, I'm optimistic in that regard. Well, that okay. Yeah. Steve, I thought of patient engagement. I'm Rob Renner from Summit Health Management. I thought about patient engagement when you were talking about the reminders for safety. And then I thought about the portal. And I know that some of our patients have actually playing when they get too many reminders. And so I'm wondering about what your thoughts are in terms of the right way to approach yeah. patient portal and the way to remind patients to <coughs> save for their health. And um, good, you know, so thought. there's a, an interesting strategy there because if you give them too many reminders, they just start not attenuating to the reminders, yep. not attending to them. Yep. In hospitals, too, alarm fatigue for yep. years. Yeah. Yeah, so this is saving for financial or just anything with health? No, saving for your own health. Yeah. So yeah. in other words, how do you get your patients to really take, because you were talking about one particular reminder yeah. that's about saving. That's right. Here, they're getting multiple reminders. Here's your labs, here's your follow-up. Don't forget your physical. Here's the physical, now you get your mammogram. Right. Yeah. And then finally they say, you know what, I've had enough. Yeah. Enough yeah. from some of the medical work. Yeah. So, so A, I, th I think it is, th look, there's lots, lo medical life is complex. Um, one of the things that we started uh, um, studying recently are rituals. And uh, if you think about rituals, rituals are different than habits. Uh, in lots of kind of uh, patient-centered medicine, we think about habits, right? If people just brush their teeth or took the medication and so on, 
I actually think that rituals are more promising than habits. And, and the difference between rituals and habits is that rituals have a, a higher order meaning yeah. uh, than, than habits. So yeah. habit is something that you do without thinking, yeah. which, which is okay as long as you do it, but then if you stop doing it, it's over. Whereas rituals are things that, are things that have a, a meaning beyond what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. not to take a religious one, but let's just think about recycling. Imagine that you think about recycling like a ritual. And it's what helps you think about yourself as a good human being. All of a sudden, not recycling is not about just a simple trade-off you're making. Am I saving 25 cents or not? It's a part of how you think about yourself as a human yeah. being. Um, this is kind of, if you're a vegetarian, right? It's a really a little hard to be 80% vegetarian. Because, because you define your personality by, by being that. By the way, I have quite a few students who are vegans and they have now a big project on why people hate vegans. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's because, it, it's because they are more, they, they seem morally superior yeah, and exactly. they feel like annoy everybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but back to your, your thing, I, I, I think that, look, we were talking at people in Kenya who don't have a regular salary. So the only approach we had was to reach them this way. If I had people who have salaries, I would go through, uh, uh, through, their, uh, pay, uh, through their monthly payroll, right? I don't think that's a, uh, you would make much better uh, speed if you did something automatic deduction rather than that. Just in this particular case, we couldn't approach it. And then I would take all kinds of things that people have to do and I would try to figure out where they would best fit with people's lives. Which are the things that we should just make a ritual? Which of the things we should try and connect it to the electrical toothpaste? Which are the things that should be notification? You see, just because notifications are easy yeah. doesn't mean that's the right thing for, yeah. for everything. So I think if you gave us the lives of patients in their complexity, we could figure out uh, what reminders, what ritual, what habit, what automatic deduction should go with what activity. So not easy, right? Not well, easy. No, not easy. So just one again from the leadership historian, one uh, connection there. So uh, one of the people I've done a lot of work on is an explorer named Ernest Shackleton, who has found himself on the ice floes in Antarctica for two years, count him, 24 months, folks. When, and the ship went was stuck, and then it went down. No GPS, no waves, no. This is the guy who went over the mountain and got back to yeah, his, yeah, to yeah. over the mountain, at the whaling station island. Anyway, one of the things he held on to, Eve, all the way through the ship going down and living on the ice and the tents and the lifeboats was a was rituals. So at midsummer and midwinter's night, there was a feast. Whether it was they were feeding just penguin at one, you know, down to the end, penguin and barnacle soup. But there was every every you know and and, and Christmas, there were rituals. They weren't habits. There are rituals, and it was clearly for Shackleton a way of maintaining morale, which is another word for goodwill, mm -hmm. right? Because his biggest enemy wasn't, you know, a payer or a crash card or some kind of mislab. His worst enemy was ennui turning to disillusionment and desperation. So, so, but rituals were really important, and I think that these kind and thinking about them, because we don't—they're not in the economic models. It couldn't be more vital right now. So we're out of time. Can you please join me in a very warm gr clap of gra gratitude to Dan? It was fabulous, fabulous.